We are in the weekly Torah portion, and it's Bahalotcha. In this Parsha, we talk about a lot of things. The first thing we talk about is the lighting of the menorah and why it has to start here. That's the first question you can ask. Why Hashem decided to tell us that Aaron was commanded to light the menorah? Uh, after all, uh, why does it start off with here? Remember last week we ended off with the, uh, the princes bringing their gift. So what's going on? That's number one. Then we also hear about the exchange. We finally get the famous exchange between the Levium, officially. The Levium become in the place of the firstborn in their service to Hashem. And then what we also hear is about Pesach Sheni. This is the source uh, for Pesach Sheni. This is where we get the mitzvah of Pesach Sheni. If you missed the original Pesach, you didn't get to bring the Korban for whatever reason. Uh, not because you didn't want to, because you didn't, you weren't close enough. Or again, there's a whole argument that, that goes about that. So you, you have one uh, the next month on the 14th day of ER, you bring the Korban Pesach, although you don't have to clean your house out, like it was Pesach, and you don't have to get rid of your chametz, mm. but you can't eat the Korban Pesach mm. uh, for the Pesach Sheni with chametz either. So, but wow. that's, and then we hear the case of, again, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the men who became Tommy, and they come to uh, because they dealt with a dead person, so they're too much mate, so they were spiritually impure from dealing with the dead body. Now, here they were doing a mitzvah, and because they're doing, and as a result of that, though, a Tommy, a person who's Tommy cannot uh, bring the Korban Pesach in the appropriate time, and that's why this whole case of uh, Pesach Sheni is brought up. And their response to that is interesting because they say to Moshe, figure it out, Rabbi, <laughs> we want to bring this. So he goes to Hashem, and that's another question. How can you just go to Hashem with this question? Why didn't Moshe say it? Uh-huh. Why wasn't Moshe built? Why didn't the Torah? Like every other mitzvah, it stated, if I ate of Hashem, I'm surely more. Why do they have to go through his introduction hmm. to tell us about Pesach Sheni? Okay. We also have the... Uh, after that, we have the famous thing about when the cloud would lift up, that's when the camp would move, when the, and how the camp moved, by the way. That the, uh, did they go in a straight line? In other words, did they go by tribe, or did they go, did they go in the formation of the camp? Uh, so, in other words, the formation would be, you have the four flags, and then the Mishkan in the middle. So, is that how they traveled? Or they travel in, you know, troops, as it were, one behind the other. Okay. Uh, they talk about um, Bamidbar, which, uh, so we understand, is wilderness or maybe desert. So how do we understand? Where wilderness is wilderness. Negev wilderness. would be desert. Yeah. Huh? Ah, Negev no, is more desert. So uh, 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 what is B'nai Yisrael? Uh, uh, what are we actually marching through here? It's, it's not the sand. It's not the Negev. Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's an uninhabited place. It's not a, it's not a great place to walk through. It's not like you see in the movies, like the sands, uh, sand dunes of Egypt. Just nothing but, you know, nothing but. Again, you you had. I'm sure that there were. Uh, I mean, it's a wilderness, so I'm, I'm sure there was grasses and stuff. But nonetheless, it wasn't a it wasn't a settled place. That's really what's going on. They're becoming a nation mm. with nobody around them. Mm. And there's that, like nomadic tribes, if you will. Yes, yeah, so there's you're marching. If you, uh, uh, you say, if you stay, if they stayed in for a formation, you got uh, uh, the Levium and, and the Mishkan in the middle. All right, all, correct. Uh, you'd need a pretty wide open space if if you did well, that. Hundred percent, correct. So the que- again, that's that's the question: How do they march? Yeah. And that you have to look at. Uh, that's actually an argument in, in the in the uh, the literature. So then you have also, uh, how do they announce to the people that they were traveling? Okay, you have the, the camp, uh, you have the cloud moving, but also Hashem commands Moshe to make trumpets, to call the, uh, to call the people together, to call the Nisim together, different reasons for everything, and, uh, which is also interesting. Then uh, we have the, uh, the formation that they'd actually have to travel and then we come to an even, even, even crazier case. We have a case where Moshe is talking to his father-in-law and saying, don't leave, stay with us. And he says, no, I'm going to go back. 
Uh-huh. Well, why does he say I want to? Be, why does he say I want to go back? To what? What was he trying? Uh, by the way, I'm not going to answer all these questions. Okay, it's <laughs> just so much to handle uh-huh. that it's not going to happen. But I'm just telling you that this parsha is so chock full of information. Uh-huh. Listen, so we, we, we figured what, there's three million people, men, women, children, all ages. Yeah. Uh, uh, do we know that the entire group, uh, around three million, actually went, or did many of those go back? Go back where? To Egypt or wherever. No, nobody went That back. was the group that left. Yeah. yeah. Those who want to say are already have gone back, whatever. Right? Nobody or went never back. Left. Nobody went back. Ah, okay. Either they died or ah, they left. Okay. That is it. Then, on, if you look on page 786, just to see it, uh, you have the famous question of, you have upside down nuns. Again, if you look to page 786, uh, and you'll see a verse 35, of hey, and you'll see two upside down nuns. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So the question is, so why there's up to, upside down nuns there? And that's actually scripted in, in the text. Yes, yeah. that's in the Torah. Why they're there? So the famous thing is to say that it is a out of place. Hashem put it there. Mm. Hashem told them to put it there, but really it doesn't belong there. Huh. It belongs in a different place. So why is it here? So they'll say to interrupt between the uh, God didn't want God did not want three negatives in a row. Oh. The first negative would be that they left. And again, I'll, I'll just run through this right now. The Lama Gimel says, Vayusu uh, Hashem Yamim. And they went, they traveled from uh, the mountain of Hashem, the way of uh, three, three uh, days. The Aaron of Hashem, no and the Aaron traveled before them. And so it says, but they left, right? So how did they leave? Like little children who are leaving school on the last day. Oh. Okay, Why, when kids leave school on the last day, how do they leave? Yay, yeah. we're free! Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so they also, when the people were leaving Sinai, they're saying, Baruch Hashem, no more rules. Oh. They were running away. <laughs> That's hinted to here. And then we come, so then you have Vayim own again, the, what, we, what we sing every, uh, what we say every yeah. time we pull the Torah out. Yeah. And also, Uvnachoy Yomar, when we put the Torah back. That's right here. This is the actual source for it. And then what we hear is after that, the people complaining to Moshe saying, we don't have meat. What do you mean we don't have meat? And then they start reminiscing. And they say, we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt for free. And the cucumbers and the melons and the uh, leeks and the onions and the yeah. radishes. Yeah. Uh, radishes? Yeah. I think that's what they are. Radishes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So... Mm-hmm. The garlic, I'm right. sorry, garlic. And the garlic, and suddenly you're having reminiscent. Now, wait a second, the, the man tastes like whatever you want it to taste like. So what do you mean? We don't have these things. You have everything. The answer is no, you don't have everything, but why not? That's the question, okay? And then it describes how the man was, that's God talking. God gets angry, burns the camp up. <laughs> People die, they dove into Moshe. Yeah. And they, they ask Moshe, save us, he dove in. Okay, fine. Then what happens is, then Moshe says, God, I can't do this alone. I need a board directors. <laughs> I need a board. Give me a break. These people are just too stubborn. I, I need somebody. I need a whole bunch of people mm. that, can, uh, that will lead along with me so they won't keep coming to me every two seconds and complaining. God says, okay, no problem. Gra- gather 70 people together. And, I'm, and from you, Moshe, just like we would light a fire from a nurse, like one candle can light many candles. So you are not taking anything away from me, but everything is going to come from you mm. and you won't lose anything for it. But since you, let me just finish. But since you wanted to uh, share the job, just understand, fine, I'm going to let you do it. Then you have the story of Eldad and Medad who start prophesizing and, uh, outside the, uh, in the camp. And suddenly, uh, uh, Yehoshua says, imprison them. But that's what they were supposed to be doing. So what's his problem? And why does Moshe say, no, it's good, let them do it. And finally, we have the case of the people, oh, no, not finally, you have two more. You have the case of the uh, uh, the people dying because they they had, uh, they, eat, they ate all the, the birds, the, the slav, the, the quail that came. So God said, I'll, I'm going to punish them that they have... They'll eat me for 30 days, and it's gonna, they'll be so disgusted, it's going to come out of their nose. That is from the Bible. That, that quote is straight from the Torah. Okay, it's gonna, you'll be so disgusted, it comes out of your nose. 
And what happens is the people die, and you have a lot of death as a result of that because they were challenging God. And finally, what happens is Moshe did not resume marital relations with his wife ever since Sinai. Mm. So, uh, and because of the incident of Eldon and so Sipora said something as an off statement to uh, see, uh, to Miriam, Mir and saying that they're not ha that they're no longer acting as husband and wife. So Miriam and starts talks to Aaron about Moshe and saying, well, what does he think? "Who does he think he is? Why is he not with his wife?" They want to get the marriage counseling apparently, and so Hashem gets involved because Moshe was the most humble of all men and wouldn't defend himself on this, and he punishes Miriam with. Saras, wow. and it makes their way for seven days until finally they can travel. That is the entire Parsha. Again, it is so storyline-wise, mm. it is one of the more powerful Parshiot because it covers just so much. Yeah, your question was? Um, when I mentioned them, I forget which part it is, when the people started, right, when the people started asking for meat, yes. and I mentioned that Moshe wanted more, wanted immediate help with the people to so Having to deal with people. Right. Didn't this already wasn't this already a conversation between him and, and, and his father-in-law? His father-in-law had said to him that you can't do this alone. You need to have a son hedron because people were coming up to right. because they were lining up to talk all the way all the way around. Right. So that was for law. But here they're coming to complain. Oh. So when it comes to complaining. Uh, and that's all it was, a complaint. Why was it a complaint? Again, I'm not going to get this, I'll answer that right now. It's because they had all this cattle. If you if you want a steak, kill your, kill your cow, leave me alone. Right. You know, what happens is people want to complain. So when you want to complain, there's no way to go with that. You know, you can complain. I, in tefillah, what do people say? You're going too fast, you're going too slow. You're going, uh, it's not, there's no warmth here. Or there's not enough talking. There is too much talking, there's not enough talking. Whatever the case is going to be. In other words, you're never going to satisfy a person who wants to complain. Right. There's, there, he's not look, he or she is not looking to solve the problem. Okay? So the people here who are saying, we want meat. We want. We remember what we had in uh, Egypt for free. We had fish for free. They, you weren't given... Uh, you, you, the stuff to make the bricks. You had to go out and get it yourself. What do you mean you got fish for free? Okay? So Rashi says, Chinam in the mitzvot. They didn't have the obligation to the mitzvot. That's how Rashi answers that. But bottom line is, you have somebody who's complaining. They were in subjugate. They were subjugated. And I'm complaining. I didn't, I'm not having that right now. Why aren't you having it? What do you want from me? What are you complaining for? I don't understand. We're doing everything that we can for you, and you're complaining. Remember, you have the clouds above, clouds below, the clouds all four. You you have security, unbelievable security with uh, air con with a uh, air conditioning, heating, whatever you want. Turn the heat up if you want. Turn the air conditioning up. You, you, whatever you want. The food tastes whatever you want to taste like. You want to taste like an uh, ice cream sandwich? Ice cream sandwich. Okay, so you got whatever you want. Uh, suddenly, you want those five things that aren't good for you? Sorry. I, I remember, I'm God. I can't do anything. I wouldn't do anything to harm you. No. So, you know, that's, it's just a complaint, which is why Moshe says to God, when God says, I'm going to give them the meat, God, uh, Moshe says, how can, how can you feed them all? It's impossible. So that's a real challenge to God. And God says, uh, uh, the answer to the, the Torah is, is my, uh, should I let them think that my hand is short? In other words, I don't have enough power. Mm -hmm. But really the whole question is, where Moshe is putting out is saying, you, but they're complaining. You can't answer a complaint. Right. You'll never satisfy them. You understand? Yeah. So really that's what's, that's what's going on here. But to the same hand, it's not 100, that they're the law. So the sign everyone give a law. The actual problem go to them and they figure out right. what the logistics are. Right. This is just a complaint note box or whatever. The There's no bit of to go to. Right. So what ho what Moshe is hoping, what his, yeah, I mean, what he's hoping in that situation is if there's more people that they can go to complain to, then those people will take care of the complaints. 
We have something called the complaint department. Okay? So those people are especially for these complainers. And to say, I understand, you're right. Let's not try to understand this, knowing that you're never going to satisfy them. That's what it is, complaint department. And I think most places have those. Suggestion uh, box. Suggestion box is another fancy way of saying, don't bother me, I'm not going to deal with you. <laughs> suggestion box, that's actually the, the shredder. You just put right, right, whatever it is. Or it could be the uh, circular file, what you call the circular file. <laughs> okay, uh, that means a garbage can. Yeah. Okay, but... <laughs> I am so good for your sleeping habits. I really am. Okay. But it's nonetheless, that is what's going on. Okay. So that's your whole Parsha. Right. Really, it's, it's a very powerful, like I said, it's a very powerful Parsha. If you read it through, certainly if you go with the Rashis, you get such a hashkafa coming out of this one that you, you really start learning what was going on in the desert or the, whatever you want to call it, the Midbar. Okay. Whatever you want to call that. Let, now, the first thing, like I said, we start off is with the, um, the menorah. So if you look to the, to the article, he says, The commentators discuss why this passage regarding the menorah is placed immediately after the long recitation of the offerings of the tribal leaders. We had the same thing, 12 in a row, uh, uh, no, no, nothing changed. And so he says, citing the Midrash Tanchuma Rashi comments that Aaron was chagrined that every tribe represented by its leader had a role in dedicating the new tabernacle while he and his tribe of Levi were excluded. By the way, this is self-excluded. They didn't bring anything. Mm -hmm. it wasn't that God said, don't bring it. They didn't think to bring it. That's why he's upset. Oh. Why didn't I think to bring anything? Oh. You know, I'm going to a party. The party's happening. I knew the party was going on. Heck, I'm running the party. Okay? And where's my tribe where all the other people jump in? Well, why wasn't I asked? Oh. You know, it's, you know it's, uh, it's, it would be similar to, let's say there, there is a kiddish going on here. It's once in a while, the staff, which is shrinking as we, <laughs> as we, as we went, we, were, we had five, then we shrinked to four, then we, okay, now we're three, uh, two, whatever. But at one point, we were uh, for the rabbi's daughter, I think that's what it was. it was, something was going on, that they asked, do we all want to share in making a kiddush? Or shalosh shoes, whatever the heck it was, okay? I forget what we sponsored, but we sponsored something for somebody's birthday. Oh, the staff did, yeah. Yeah, I forget what, whose yeah. birthday, but I, I think it was a birthday. Could have been bad mitzvah, but that wouldn't make sense. Must have been a birthday. And so, but everyone was asked, okay? Imagine... If they all got along, the, the, the remaining staff, as it were, got together without asking me, or I was somebody else and didn't ask the other person, you know, you'd feel left out. Yeah. Why didn't yeah. you ask me? I don't understand. You all, you all got together and decided that you're going to give these certain kabanot with the, with the wagons, everything else. Why didn't you ask my tribe? We're all brothers, right? And so that did not happen. That didn't happen. So that's why he, he's a little upset, he's chagrined, he's saddened, not upset, he's saddened. Okay, so he says, so he continues on to say, consequently, God comforted him by saying that this, that his service that he was going to do was greater than theirs because he would prepare and kindle the menorah. That's, that's Rashi. <laughs> now, Ramban says no. He explains why the menorah was singled out for this consolation. Instead of other more auspicious rituals, such oh. as Yom Kippur service, which must be performed exclusively by the Kohen Gadol, he explains, based in part on the Tanchuma, that the kindling in this passage alludes to a later menorah, that of the miracle of Hanukkah. Hmm. This is the famous thing that Ramban brings down. God was alluding to Aaron that his role was greater than that of the leaders, because there would be a time when the temple service would be discontinued by the Syrian Greeks, and the Torah would be on the verge of being forgotten. Only the faith and the heroism of the Chashmonayim, a family of Aaron's priestly descendants, would succeed in driving out the enemy, purifying the temple, 
and once more kindling the menorah after a tragic hiatus of many years. Mm. Thus God comforted Aaron by telling him that his family would one day save the nation. Mm. The offerings of the tribal leaders were great and impressive, but they were temporary. Mm. Aaron's contribution would be eternal. Let mm. me just finish. Yeah. Okay. In explaining the view of the Baal Halachot Gedolot, who reckons lighting the menorah Hanukkah as one of uh, Hanukkah menorah as one of the 613 mitzvot, Ramban suggests that there is a commandment to celebrate the inauguration of the temple or the renewal of the altar that took place uh, at the, after the Hanukkah menorah, uh, Hanukkah miracle, by bringing special and unprecedented offerings as the tribal princes did in the wilderness. These offerings serve the function of hoda, of giving thanks for being able to dedicate or rededicate an instrument through which to serve Hashem. Aaron felt wounded that he had not been able to join the princes in this form of thanksgiving. In response to this, Hashem informed Aaron that not only his offerings, but the kindling of the menorah is an expression of thanks. This is why kindling was instituted as a commemoration of Hanukkah, when the temple was rededicated, and why this passage is read on the last day of Hanukkah in conjunction with the offerings of the princes. That's from Rav Soloveitchik. Oh. Or Hachayim answers in the plain sense that the process of cleaning and preparing the lamps of Hanor require that they be removed literally or virtually every day, Thus, Aaron would, in effect, be building a new menorah every single day. So you have a couple of different ways to look at this. But again, the Ramban's famous uh, response is, is referring to Hanukkah. Yeah. So, I had a thought and it's confusing. So, the temple... You had a thought and it's confusing? Yeah, yeah, because the okay. temple was... They only had two temples. Yes. So like the, and the Mishkan. In the Mishkan. You said the Mishkan in the desert built the temple, don't need a Mishkan anymore. Had the first temple, it got destroyed by the Babylonians. Yes. Somewhere in between that, we rebuilt it. We built the second. Had yes, the second seventy years later. Right, and then the, right because when Cyrus right. sent the people back, uh, and then the Greeks sacked it but didn't destroy it. The Greeks sacked the Assyrians. It. The Syrian Hanukkah. Greeks. Okay, would that be the case? They sacked it but didn't destroy it. Right, correct. Right, okay. That's what I was confused with. How many times are those the only times? Then three times. It's been sacked three times. Out of those three times, it was. It was destroyed twice. Correct. Okay, just those. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So here we go. So let's look at the Pesukim inside. It says, Vayedaber Hashem Moshe Lehmo. So Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, He spoke to Moshe. He didn't talk to Aaron. He spoke to Moshe because Moshe is the lawgiver here. So, Daber al Aaron, speak to Aaron. Vimarti 11 said to him, and you will say to him, Valot Chai and he wrote, when you uh, cause the light, when you bring up the lights, or when you light the lights, in other words, when you kindle the lights, El Mul Menorah, which would be opposite the face of the menorah. Yair Shavat Menorot, you will light seven candles. We already said that what's going on here is that he has to tell him to light the menorah, which was connected to the sadness. Now, what happens? Rashi says, Bahalokha, an interesting thing that he says. He says, Al Shem Shalahav Ola Katuv Halakhtan, because it's, when it's talking about the flame, that it has to go up, which means that you tsarich. That you have to hold the light, the flame there, until the light can go on its own. In other words, when I light a candle, what's the use of lighting the candle? I want that light to go on its own, right? So that's what he had to do. And from here, the rabbis learn. Okay. Uh, that they have to, uh, the coin has to make it good, so it goes up. What we also learned from this is in teaching, when I'm teaching, a, uh, my job in teaching is to make you independent, just as we had to make the lamp independent, that it would go up on its own. So also, educationally, I have to give you the resources that you can go on your own and grow in Torah. You understand? That's also coming from Baha Lodra when you bring it up. Yeah. So our job as teachers, as parents, is not just to give you information, but to be to have, give you the skills and the desire, desire. I don't know. I guess desire would be first, but desire and skills to be able to go on your own. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So. Here he also says in 
And here, number two, on the, the it says, toward the face of the Nora. Just let's go through it. As explained, the three wicks of the, of the right and the three on the left were all directed toward the menorah's central stem, thus concentrating the light toward the center. Because its light was not spread out, the menorah symbolized that Hashem, the source of all light, did not need it to illuminate his tabernacle. Right? Because you would think, why do we have light? Because it's dark in there. Even with all, the, you have, remember, you have tent over <laughs> skin over skin over skin. It's, the sun is not coming through. So as a result, it must be dark in there. So if I have dark, I have to have a light. Okay. So the answer is no, because you're putting all the, the flames to, uh, reaching toward the middle. So it says the right symbolizes, so the, now we get into Sforno. The right side symbolizes those who engage in spiritual pursuits, while the left symbolizes temporal activity, this world activity. Now, so the right side, I'm sorry, the right side is spiritual. The left side is not spiritual. I have to do these things. Okay. By having both sides of the menorah give light toward the center, the Torah teaches that all of man's activities should be directed toward the service of Hashem. So when I'm spiritual, I, I you may think it's easier to go towards Hashem, but sometimes I'm just being spiritual, I forget who I'm being spiritual for. And also when I'm working. Now when I'm working, I'm certainly not doing it the same Shem I am. That's not the, you're working to get money, you're working for whatever. And yet I'm supposed to channel that to the, to the middle. So really both of us are going towards the same uh, thing, to serve Hashem. So, and you need both, both elements, you need the spiritual and the secular, so, and to, to combine and work towards God. Okay, so that's what the Quantisforno, what the uh, symbolism of the menorah is. Yeah. So the, the light of the fire would aim towards the center? Yeah. Okay. So the wicks. The, the wicks would be. Oh, the wick. Oh, the wicks. You would have the wicks, so the wick would be. Was, here's the center. Right. So this wick would go like oh, this. Oh, so this, it's because this. it's just laying in, like in, the, in bowls on top or like cups. So the, 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 it's right. just laying it there like that. Right. So you're putting it this yeah. way and this way. So everything right. is. Okay. Uh, for a second, I thought it was the. Right. Is that, is that they bent the wicks that way to do that on purpose? So it's yes. a miracle or. No, no, no. They just, they're just part of it. Okay. So for, they, for a second, they, I was thinking of a, of a menorah, but the arms like pointed slowly. Pointed no, 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 the arms are not. It's the wick. The wicks. The wicks. Okay. The wicks are pointing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's how Rashi explains it. So Vayaz Kain Aaron, so Aaron did this, and that's an un the question is why did it have to tell you that he did this? Rashi says it's a shavach, like it's shavach shal Aaron shal Shina. It's a praise to Aaron that he didn't change anything. Now you have to ask Aaron is a tzaddik. What's your I mean, what, what would you think that he would change it for? He wouldn't change anything, but still not. We give shavach, we give uh, praise when you don't change God's words. Huh. It's a lesson because here you have this person who is way above everybody else. Most, you have most of them, fine. But then you're going to have our Kohen who had one sin in his entire life, namely Eglisov, not such a small sin either, but uh, that's his one sin, but he doesn't do anything else wrong. And so he may also think that he's, you know, he can get up there, but he doesn't, he never lets his arrogance take over. So he, whatever Hashem says, that's what he does. Yeah. His yeah. life is totally the Shem Shemayim. Yeah. So he does that, El Mupane Menorah, to, uh, where he, uh, how does he say that? He kindled, uh, right, so toward the face of the uh, menorah, he kindles the light, the several lights. So, uh, toward, right, Hela Narta, he lights the candles, just as Hashem commanded Moshe. Okay, and uh, yeah. So then it says there, Ma'aseh Menorah. This is the act of, or the workmanship of the Menorah, Miksha Zahav. It was of him and our gold, Adirecha and Pircha, Miksha He. Again, from the base to his flowers, him and out. Kamara, Shehera, Hashem, Moshe. Like the, like the appearance. I guess you would translate that, uh, the, according to the vision that Hashem showed Moshe came outside of Menorah, uh, th thus he made the Menorah. So who's the he? So that's the question you have, who's the he? And so Rashi explains, as he did before, that this was made by Hashem, hmm. uh, according to the Midrash, because when he showed Moshe, when Hashem showed Moshe the uh, Menorah, 
uh, Moshe did not understand how you're supposed to get it. Remember, out of one piece of gold, he's supposed to hammer all this stuff out, beat it out, and it's very intricate. So he never, he couldn't get it. So that's when Hashem said, throw the, uh, throw the piece of gold into the fire oh. and it'll come out on its own. So he, God, made the uh, menorah. And once they, I guess, once they saw the menorah, then they would know how to make it after that point. Yeah. Isn't that how he made the uh, golden calf? Aaron. 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 No. Right. no. Yeah, the, the reason that, again, just for the golden calf, uh, what happened was, you had, first of all, it says that he, that Aaron, uh, made the mold, but uh-huh. even without that, even without that mold, you still have the midrash that says that uh, Micha took the piece of metal and said, "Arise, O shore, arise, O shore, uh, arise, O shore, al shore, al shore," and when he threw that into the gold, that had that, it had the uh, whatever magic that it, whatever you want to call that, so that the calf came out. So either way, either he may actually made a mold for it or because of that. But it wasn't that God made it. God doesn't right. make idols. But this, he didn't, uh, Moshe couldn't understand. So Hashem uh, says, okay, I'll help you out. Yeah. Okay, now now we come to the uh, to Levium. We're seeing how the consecration of the Levium uh, happened. So he says, Again, explanation to this is consecration in 5 to 26. To assume their new status as substitutes for the firstborn in serving Hashem and transporting the tabernacle, the Levites required a sacrificial ritual, as did the consecration of the Kohanim. The ritual and their ages of eligibility to serve are given here. So we now find out what happened. So, Vayedavar Hashem Moshalem, again, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Kach et Halevim, take the Levim, we talk Israel from the midst of. Bnei Yisrael v'tihartotam and spiritually cleanse them, fine, purify them. Rashi is bothered. What does it mean take the Levium? Can I take you anywhere oh. as an adult? Can I take you without permission? No. Without permission? No. So the, exactly. Whenever it says kach uh, in, uh, in relation to somebody else, it means kachem b'devarim ashreichem. Take them with. Uh, with words, in other words, say Ashreichem Shetitzku Liot Shemashim LeMakom. You should be happy that you have merited to be the Shamish to Hashem, to be the servant to Hashem. In other words, when I'm taking you, when it's Kach Levim, I have to convince the Levim that I'm giving that they're getting a good job. Okay, you're, being, you're serving Hashem. Because why do I have to take these poor Levim? No land. <laughs> Remember, you're not getting land from this. So if you're not getting land, I have to convince you that what you're getting a better deal. Okay? And on top of that, you're not Kohanim. You're Levium. As a Kohen, I get an Aliyah. And when I walk into Shul, I get the Aliyah. Right? If no other Kohen is here. So there's another Kohen, they can get it. But one of us, one of my brothers, my Kohanic brothers, gets an Aliyah. Anytime I walk in, it's going to happen. When a lady walks in without me, there's no other, there's no other, as they call in, the lady walks in, maybe he gets an Aaliyah, maybe he doesn't get an Aaliyah. Some shuls don't give him an Aaliyah, period, really because there's no Kohen there, and his only reason he's getting honor is because of me. Okay, if I'm not there, he doesn't get honor. And so others will give him the honor, but they can give the Israel the same honor. Yeah. They can say, Bimkom, yeah. Kohen, yeah, yeah. can come to me, Yisrael. So what are you? You're, you're, you're nothing. Huh. Okay, you're in the middle. You're in the middle. You're, you don't have, you're not here to know their reality. So I have to convince the Kohen, the Levium, that, you know, Hashem picked you to help the Kohanim in this service, and you're going to get some reward for that. And but think about think about it, the, the beauty you have. You're serving Hashem. It's your whole life is to serve Hashem. So that's kach. Uh, so, uh, yep. so the way I understand, so kach, uh, it's command, right? Yeah. Uh, kach. So really, we translate it as as take in English. It makes more sense. Say, yeah, I'm going to take you with me. Right. You know. So, but uh, the implication in Hebrew is a little bit different than that. Because you can't physically... Correct. 
You can't physically take, that's why whenever it says kach, anybody, it means you have to convince them. What? Ki kach ish et isha. When a man takes a woman, ah. that's what it says. Now, kach yeah. is also a, a language of uh, acquisition. Ah. So when a man oh, so buys a woman, okay? Yeah. When a man takes a woman, what am I doing when I'm taking the woman? Again, I have to, it's not, you know, we always you have. You to the contract, right? Yeah, it's not like the old days where the you have the picture of the caveman yeah. dragging the woman by, yeah. by the hair. Come with me, <laughs> woman. Oh. That may be where the English comes from in, in that usage. Yeah, but like I said, here when I'm marrying yeah. the girl, I have to convince her. Even yeah. in America, yeah. there I am. I have yeah. to convince the girl yeah. that is to, yeah. to her be, to her benefit to marry me. So I say this: I want to take you to the store with me. So, well, I don't want to go. So I. Not taking you. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so that's why we say, do you want to go to the store with me? Yeah. Or, you know, but because you can't physically force somebody yeah. Yeah. to do something against their will. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless they're small, but we're, not, we're dealing with adults. Okay. And we're also dealing with 22,000 people here. 22,273 to be exact. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm able to force one little shrimp, but not 22,273. There's a lot of people to start forcing. Yeah, so, so in English, really, there, there's nuances of meaning in the same. Uh, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. So, but that's why everybody. That's why Rashi has to say, yeah. take them with persuasive words. So, you I mean, can't it, just take them. The normal uh, grammatic use in Hebrew would, would be more to an object when you would say. Kind yes. Of, take yes. the book. Yes. Take ah, the book. Ah. Take the book, and that means acquire the book. Ah, ah. Acquire it. It's yours. Okay. So, uh, but that's why they say kach is lashon, kicha is lashon uh, kinyan. Okay. That taking is a language of acquisition. Okay. Yeah. And so, how are you going to do this? How are you going to purify them? This is how you're going to purify them. You're going to sprinkle upon, sprinkle upon them the uh, waters, uh, uh, um, what do they call it? Purifying waters, but it's a uh, water. Okay, that's what they call it. Water purification. And you're going to pass. You're going to shave their entire, all their flesh. And you're going to wash the clothes. And you're going to cleanse them. Again, we're going through the mikvah. So why do you have to take off all of the hair? Why do they have to shave all the hair off? Rashi says that it's a matter of... Uh, it's interesting. He doesn't say it here. Wow. Look at that. Rashi says... That is because, um, where is it? Because they were given us a kapara on the Bechorot of the firstborns that served a Vodazara. And when they first, what was the Vodazara? Golden, Golden calf. Good. And who is it? That's called the sacrifice of the dead. And also, Matsora is called dead. And so they are forced, they, they have to shave like Mitzorim. This as Mitzora, we would have to shave in order to become pure. So also these people who were replacing the firstborn, who were involved in a Vodazara, mm. so that's the schmutz, ah. the dirty, the, I don't uh, know, the, um, the dirt. The, the, so how do, we, how do we justify this? What do you mean? Because you can't scrape the hair off of your head or your face. For this you can. Ah, for, the, this. The, for the Mitzora it did. For the Mitzvah, they had to shave. There was uh, okay, so as opposed to any other time you yeah can, right. You you can't do anything. The corners of your head. Right, right. you can't do it normally. But okay. if, if the Torah commands, you have to do okay. it. Okay. And the reason is because that's what you did as a Mitzvah, and that had to do with the dead and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we want to cleanse you from yeah. that, and that's part of the ritual yeah. that you have to go through. Yeah. Now it, the truth is, for the Mitzvah, it made sense. It makes more sense because they're. Your is part is also embarrassing. You mean I mean you're walking around without any hair. You're, you're clean, you know, like a so cue ball or something, body. right? Well, it, it means that that which is seen. It doesn't necessarily mean not legs. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not it's not your underarms and stuff. Oh, right? so it's, uh, it's mostly the head then. The head, head and I mean, you, whatever was exposed. Oh. Whatever could be exposed, whatever normally is exposed. So they, it could be the legs. I'm not going to deny the legs because the legs could have been exposed, mm -hmm. but not the midsection. I mean, I get, yeah, yeah. places that are covered up the oh. entrance, no. Oh. So, or where they have, uh, it says a collection of hair. So, like I said, the armpit, yeah. they probably had to take off the eyebrows, though. Ooh. 
So it was, again, you're walking around looking at that. So sure, when you're Mitzorah, yeah. it makes sense. Because why, why are you Mitzorah? Mm -hmm. Why do you have Sarah? Because you spoke Lashon Hara. So this makes a clear distinction. But here the Levium yeah. didn't do anything wrong. So the question would be, you know, what's going on here? Why, yeah. why do you require all that? Nonetheless, that's what it was. That's part of the purification pro uh, mm -hmm. process. Like I said, you have to uh, clean the clothes. Why uh, clean the clothes? Again, that was uh, so that before also have to do with uh, the mitzora. It all has to do with the mitzora, and that's why you had to do it. Okay. So then, velachu parp and pakar. Then you, they will take uh, the the, uh, the young bull. I mean, chato and his meal offering, solid blue b'shamen which is fine flour mixed with oil, parsheni, a second bowl, you're going to take for a sin offering. So you have uh, this, uh, the Rashi says, the first one is for an Ola. He says, who, who Ola, this is the Ola offering that you bring. Fine, that was because the Korban Sibor Bavodazar, that was for the communal sacrifice for the Avodazara. The second one was to say uh, for the chata. Where does he say it? She doesn't say it. it. Says right here. Oh, so just oh, just as the ola wasn't eaten, so also the chata wasn't eaten. And for this, they relied upon the words. Okay, the omer ani. Then so Rashi says that this is was a what we call a hiraat sha'a, and uh, as teaching for the moment. Now it's normally. You eat the chatat, but here you don't. Okay. So, so is the same kind. Oh, of I'm sorry. No, he's saying something else. He says that here normally you bring a ram, not a bull. Okay, I'm sorry. Here he says you bring a seir, which I'm pretty sure is a ram. They change it as ram. That you bring for the chatat for a zara with the par haola. I'm oh, sorry. He wasn't talking about eating there. Yeah. Sorry. So is this? Moshe trying to convince the Levium that it's better than... No, he already said it. In other words, oh. Kach and Levium was no, convinced was, them. Oh, okay. Now, we have to, once you kind of convinced you, now this is how you're going to do it. Oh, okay, okay. okay. I mean, there was really, they really didn't have much of a choice. They're, right. You know, Hashem said this was happening. You don't have anything else, so here's, the, here's your thing. It's Basically. Just, it's so much better. All right, what do we do? All right, first you got to shake your face. Well, no, you're not doing it. No, right. right. They are. Yeah, right. That's part of the process. Right. But uh, yeah, that is what's going on. So, but again, if the if Moshe is doing it and he's coming, everybody accepts that he's coming from God. Right. So there, it's not hard to convince somebody to do that. You know, once I once I know what's going on, I know this is from Hashem. It's okay. That's what it is. And uh, you do, so a little a uh, little bit of this, a little bit of that, and next thing you know, I'm serving in the base of Mikdash uh, or the Mishkan. So they crop the Levium. You will bring the Levium before the uh, the tent of meeting. The Kalta, and you're going to gather together all Kol Adap and Israel, all of Israel. So the question is why? It says the Fisha Levium Netunim Korban Kapara Tachtehem, since the Levium were bringing. The korban as a kapara in their place. Yavo, they should come. Yamdu al kabanam, they the, the bnei Israel should stand on their korban. Visuhu atidem alem, and they should put their hands on them. And there is, if I'm bringing a korban for you, so you have to do what you have to do. Is you have to put you have to put your hands on it. Yeah. Say this is in my place, or you are in my place. Whatever the case is going to be. Okay, so he says in, in English, he, he brings it down in nine, where he says the Levites who had replaced the firstborn who had sinned were tantamount to offerings uh, for the nation. So it was appropriate for the people to lean their hands on the heads of the Levites as does as one does with the, uh, the offering. The waving of the Levites too was representative of their status as symbolic... Offerings, alternative leaving, uh, leaning upon a human being denotes that the person leaned upon his elevated to position of distinction as when Moshe leaned upon Yehoshua. Thus the Jews leaned upon the heads of the Levites to represent their assumption of an exalted position. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is where you get the word smicha from. Yeah. Okay? When the rabbis got smicha, the, the other rabbi put their hands on this guy's head and said, this is, now you're the leader. Okay, so smicha is, uh, it, it also means blanket, 
That's the interesting thing about tzmicha. But it's but that's what we get today. Nobody leans a. You know who does it still? I remember that when my uh, the conservatives still do it. They symbolically put their heads. I heard. I don't know. If, I didn't see it because I wasn't there for it. But they. Uh, I heard they put their hand. I should ask my sister law They put their hands on the head of the person, saying, "You, you have now smicha," which it would be interesting, you know. But I think they still have that sort of tradition. Maybe it's fallen away already. I, I don't even remember if they did it with her. So, because I wasn't there for it, so I didn't see it. Mm. I would have thought it was strange. <laughs> I would think it's more bizarre after all. But it's, is it, nonetheless. Is that like the because it's a Christian thing? Say again? Is that like the Christian, like the knighting thing? Uh, I don't know why the you're talking about the queen when right. she would knight the, uh, I, or the king. So it could be the same sort of right. concept. It probably is. I mean, they get that from the Torah. So most of the stuff they get is from the Torah. Right. It's just a misreading, but um, they don't. They, but they wouldn't put their hands on it. Right. It was just a sword that they're doing that. Oh. So yeah, I'm not sure. I'm yeah, not sure. It could come from there. Yeah, yeah. It probably, I, I guarantee, it comes from there, but it's not. Yeah. You know, they don't do it right either. Conceptually. <laughs> okay. So then, what happens is the corrupt levim lefnei Hashem. So you will bring the levim before Hashem v'samchu b'nei Yisrael to them all levim again. Here it's very straight. The Bnei Yisrael will lay their hands on the uh, their hands on Levim. And if Aaron and Levim to new fall of Hashem, now here's something that you, you read and you don't understand it. Aaron would wave. How do you wave something like this? Up, down, like this. Yeah, okay, that's how you wave it. Up and down, like this. Oh. Okay, done. So now you have to pick up twenty-two thousand two hundred seventy-three people. <laughs> That's a lot of people to start waving around. Yeah. But that's what it says. Aaron and Levim to new followers of Hashem that he waved them. Aaron waved the Levim as a wave off from before Hashem and Ipin Israel from Ben Israel. And they would serve the service of Hashem. Now it says enough that Aaron had been instructed to lift and wave the Levites. Now Moshe was told to do the same. The two wavings represented two different missions that now devolved upon them. Moshe lifted them to formalize their position as assistants to the Kohanim, and Aaron lifted them as a representative of the nation to formalize the Levites' assumption to the status of a firstborn. It's a album. And Vayikra Rabba comments on the prodigious strength and stamina that were needed for Moshe and Aaron to lift, to lift bodily 22,000 Levites in a single day. Now you can say it's miraculous. You can say what you want. I, I don't care. How you're gonna. What do you want to uh, argue with this? It's a lot of work. <laughs> but again, it's strange that you'd have to. That's how. What does the consecrate? We don't do that. Anything like that today? Okay. We, there's nothing. When I pick up, when I our firstborn is redeemed, I don't start lifting him up and shaking him. <laughs> I don't do anything. So, you know. So it, it was a one-time event. But think about that. You don't. You have. Cohen, you have only Aaron and Cohen. At most, you would have had his two sons, and they weren't doing it either. And most would have been. Maybe just put put, your, put his hands on his no, shoulders. No, you have to lift. The lifting, yeah. <laughs> That's why my Yikra Rabba is saying he had, he had stamina. Yeah. We still do that with the uh, uh, lulav. The lulav. Yeah, 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 lulav. Right. You're right. It's similar, but not really. Well, no, you're doing it exactly. No, you're shaking it this way, uh, the four corners, up and down. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, That's the waving ceremony. Yes, exactly that. So imagine doing that to the... Uh, oh, <laughs> you know, if I was a gangster, I could sit... <laughs> but otherwise, it is, it's hard. It's hard. But that's what happened. Okay? So, uh, yeah. So then, Halavim, so we're on 12th. So now the Levim would rest their hands. Al Rosh Parim on top of the head of the cows, as uh, the bull. And again, they, he would make the first one a chata. The other one would be an ol offering to Hashem. Lichapir al Halavim to to atone for the Levim. So. Uh, okay, fine. And Vamad de Levim, so you're going to cause the Levim to stand, or you're going to, uh, yeah, you, 
So it says, uh, before Aaron and his sons, again, you're going to wave them as a, as a wave offering to Hashem. You're going to separate the Levim from the midst of B'nai Yisrael. And the Levim will be to me, God. God's saying they're going to be mine. Okay? You separate them from the rest, they're going to be for me. Which means they'll be in my service. That's what it means. You have all of him, and after that, the Levim will come to serve in the Oha Moed, and you will purify them. And again, you will wave them as a wave offering. Because they were surely given. Uh, is that what they say? They were surely given. Where is that? That's 50, 16. Uh, for presented, presented are they. Okay. Uh, to me, from the midst of B'nai Israel, Tachat in place of Pitro Korechem, the firstborn of uh, the, the opening of the, the womb, Bechor, we call the B'nai Israel, the firstborn of all from B'nai Israel, the Kachti Otamli, I took them for me. Now, here's something very important. When Hashem did this, he says, Tacha Pitro Korechem, in place of the, open, the firstborn, right? Mm -hmm. So the firstborn, what, today, if you're a firstborn, we still have to redeem you, right? Why do we have to redeem you? The, the Levium did a long time ago. What's going on here? The Levium are tomorrow, really they're an exchange for the firstborns. And we have a rule about tomorrow. I mean, this is the best way I can explain it. We have a rule, for, besides the Torah says to do it, but why is the Torah demanding it? Because there's a rule of tomorrow. If I have an offering that I have to give to Hashem, and I decide I have a better one, so I say, you know, I'm going to, and I already established it, this, this is going to be holy to Hashem. And I say, you know what, I'm going to replace it, so I'm going to give this. Well, Hashem says, no, you can't do that. Both of them are now holy. Okay, so the Levim are always going to be holy, but the firstborn is also holy. I have to now buy a, a buy. He has to buy himself out of that yeah, service. Yeah. And he has to give the money to the Kohen. Because that, even though he's replaced by the Levim, since the Levim are, quote-unquote, servants to the Kohanim, that's why the Kohanim, according to the Torah, get the money. You would think that if I'm replacing the Levi, he's paying, he's... He's taking my place. I should pay the levy, right? But the answer is no. We're giving it to the coin because that's what Hashem wanted. It's a fascinating thing. It's all coming for that. Okay, and he says, uh, because all the firstborn from Israel belong to me, from the men and from the animals. Why? Because on the day that I struck down all the firstborn of Israel, I sanctified them from me. Okay, we'll have to stop there. But that is what is uh, why the Levium are given this this uh, privilege to serve Hashem. Okay. Yeah.